Welcome to the quantum realm, a place where the impossible thrives. Sci-fi fans and explorers, this is your gateway. We're diving into the unknown. Hit subscribe and join the mind-bending journey. The vastness of space has always been our playground. I, General Astreus Lionheart, have lived more years amongst the stars than I have on any planet. Home, to be frank, is a fuzzy concept, a relic of a time when humanity was content to huddle on a single, vulnerable world. No longer. We are the inheritors of a thousand generations of pioneers. Our ancestors, unsatisfied with the confines of Earth, struck out. Terraforming planets, building orbital habitats, engineering humanity itself to thrive in this harsh and beautiful environment. The result? Not an empire, as some of the old history texts might have you believe, but a vast tapestry of cultures, united by our shared roots and our enduring hunger for the unknown. I sit in the command chair of the ISS Valiant, pride of the Terran Astral Fleet. This isn't the first deep space cruiser I've captained, nor hopefully, the last. But the Valiant, she's special. A marvel of engineering and ingenuity. Three kilometers long, armored with an osmium tungsten alloy that makes the concept of broadside cannons laughable. It's a city of 10,000 souls, scientists, technicians, tactical experts, all sworn to protect and expand humanity's footprint. At the helm sits my second and closest confidant, Kyleen Stargazer. Her ancestors hailed from an orbital ring nation, where genes edited for zero gravity and heightened spatial awareness became the norm. Where others wrestle with navigation, Kyleen dances with trajectories, her long, nimble fingers coaxing our behemoth through the void. General, she begins, a note of excitement in her musical voice, sensor array is picking up something interesting. Long-range scans suggest an unusually dense asteroid field, but the spectrograph readings are wonky. My eyes narrow. Wonky how? An abundance of rare transition metals, elements that shouldn't naturally cluster in those quantities. It might be a remnant of a shattered planet, but the physics don't add up. Intriguing, I muse. This was exactly why we were out here on the rim. Humanity had a long-reaching network of colonies and outposts, but it was the unexplored stretches that held the keys to further progress. I rise, my movements fluid despite the enhancements woven into my very bones. Alter course, Lieutenant Stargazer. Let's see what secrets this debris field holds. The bridge of the Valiant is a controlled symphony of motion and sound. Crew members at their stations tap out complex commands through haptic interfaces, their gazes flicking between holographic displays. I cross to a central viewport and peer out at the swirling chaos of the asteroid field. Rocks both massive and minuscule dance in an uneasy ballet, remnants of some ancient cataclysm. Lieutenant Commander Turaler, I address our chief science officer, your take? Salvage, or something more unusual? Turaler is as alien as humanity gets. Three centuries ago, an offshoot of our people discovered the ruins of a long-dead civilization on a remote moon. The Zelari, they called themselves, were masters of bio-manipulation and integration. A select group of Terrans underwent what amounted to a splice, gaining certain Zelari traits. The results, standing some seven feet tall before me, were phenomenal. Tyre's four eyes blink in sequence, the motion disconcerting to those unfamiliar yet strangely elegant. The spectrographic readings are inconsistent with any known planetary formation, general. I cannot rule out artificial composition. I stroke my chin, a human affectation I've never bothered to suppress. Artificial? As in, a constructed object rather than debris? It's possible, Turaler confirms, but if so, it is massive, potentially dwarfing even the Valiant herself. A murmur ripples through the bridge. Even hardened spacers are susceptible to a touch of awe in the face of the truly gargantuan. Kyleen lets out a soft whistle, so, not an express lane to some juicy minerals, huh? Fear not, Lieutenant, boredom was never on the agenda, I assure her, Turaler, can you refine your scans? Find me the core of this anomaly, whatever it may be. The Zellari scientist swivels back to his station. Three of his arms work in concert, the fourth seemingly conducting some unseen orchestra as he manipulates the sensor arrays. Ours bleed into each other. We edge closer to the field, the Valiant's forward shields raised. Spaceborne debris isn't something to trifle with, especially while investigating a mystery. Finally, Turaler straightens. General, I'm seeing something, not a solid structure, as such, but a convergence of energy readings unlike anything I've cataloged before. Space itself seems, warped, for lack of a better term. I frown. 
Warp space conjures up images of wormholes or those theoretical Alcabir drives that tantalize physicists back on Earth, but the energy signatures don't match. Can you isolate the source of the distortion? Negative, general. The warp effect appears to be enveloping a large swathe of the field, making pinpointing an epicenter impossible. I make a snap decision. Bring us to the edge of the affected area. All stop. I want a full sensor sweep and tactical analysis before we venture further. The Valiant shudders as powerful thrusters counter our momentum. Despite our size, we're as maneuverable as a fighter craft compared to the lurching colony ships of old. Within minutes, we hold a stationary position. Report. I bark. It's time to find out if we've stumbled across a gold mine or a galactic booby trap. Gravitational readings are fluctuating, announces a tactical officer. Micro spikes, nothing our compensators can't handle, but suggestive of something massive and unstable beneath the field. Long-range scans show no other ships, Terran or otherwise, Kylene adds, we seem to be alone out here. Any emissions that might give us a clue as to what's causing the spatial distortion? I ask Turaler. He shakes his massive head. Nothing but a diffused energy wash, general. It's like, background static across the electromagnetic spectrum. I tap a finger against my command chair. The possibilities swirl. Abandoned alien tech? A natural phenomenon we've never encountered? The knot in my gut says none of the above. General, Turaler breaks the tense silence, I propose a probe. Elaborate. We launch a drone, heavily shielded, packed with a suite of advanced sensors. It enters the warp zone, collects data, and transmits it back to us. Minimal risk to the Valiant. It's a sound plan. I should be relieved there's a relatively safe way to poke this cosmic hornet's nest. Yet, the unease persists. We're explorers, yes, but not reckless ones. I run through potential scenarios, every outcome analysis training drilled into me since my days as a cadet. But there are too many unknowns, too many whispers of wrongness that defy quantification. Lieutenant Stargazer, I say finally, rig warp engines for a 10 second burst. Maximum power. Turaler, prep a probe, but hold launch until my order. A sense of anticipation descends upon the bridge. My Terrans, they don't get rattled easily. Boredom is a greater foe than most cosmic anomalies. But this, this feels different. Why the warp burst, sir? Kylene asks, her voice tight. Because I have a hunch, I admit, a hunch that whatever is out there, it's about to show its hand. If I'm right, we may need to make a very hasty exit. I give the order and attention settles over the bridge thicker than any asteroid field. Turala reports the probe is ready, its shields reinforced to withstand the rigors of the warp zone. Kylene's fingers dance over her console as she preps the warp engines. Mark. I snap, and the lights on the bridge dim, casting the crew in an eerie red glow. All stations, prepare for potential turbulence. We hold our breath. One second, two, three. Initiating warp. Kylene announces. The very fabric of reality seems to groan around us. The stars outside the viewport smear into streaks of light. The Valiant shudders, not from the acceleration, but from something fundamental, as if the ship herself objects to the violation of physics we're committing. Four seconds, five, a tremor ripples through the deck. Alarms blare, not damage reports, but sensor overload warnings. The air crackles with displaced energy. 8 seconds, 9, my eyes sting and I see spots flash against the red-tinted darkness. Something is very wrong. 10. Cut it. I roar over the din. Kylene kills the warp drive. The stars snap back into focus, sharp and cold. Chaos on the bridge recedes slowly. Blinking away tears of disorientation, I scan the displays. Status. I bellow. Shields at 80% and holding, comes the tactical officer's reply, minor power fluctuations in a few subsystems. Nothing critical. Damage control teams echo his assessment. The Valiant is a tough old bird. We pushed her hard, but she hadn't broken. Yet, everything feels subtly off. Turaler, what the hell did we just do? I ask. He swivels his massive form to face me, all four eyes focused. We warped, general, but not in a, conventional sense. The sensor logs are nonsensical. It's as if we jumped a few hundred light years, but without actually traversing the distance. Lieutenant Stargazer, I say, my voice tight, where are we? She frowns, manipulating the navigation display. 
I watched the flicker of recognition in her eyes, followed by a deep, dawning horror. Sir, the readings, they don't match any star charts on record. She looks up at me, her gaze haunted. I think we're still in the same general vicinity, but, something's changed. The asteroid field is still there, surrounding us. But the warp zone, that strange energy signature, it's simply gone. Vanished. As if it were never there. I run a hand through my close-cropped hair, the simple gesture grounding me. We didn't glean much data from our reckless stunt, but one thing is crystal clear, whatever lay at the heart of that anomaly, we poked it, and it poked back. A cold certainty settles in my gut. We've stumbled onto something bigger than ourselves, something potentially dangerous. Yet, duty sits heavy on my shoulders. Helm, plot a course back to Earth, I order. Best possible speed. Whatever answers we seek, they might be waiting for us back home. Days blur into an uneasy routine. The crew of the Valiant, trained to handle all manner of crises, now wrestle with a phantom. What, precisely, had we done out there? Speculation swirls through the corridors, but the senior staff shares my concerns, the silence from Earth itself is unsettling. No long-range comms traffic is reaching us. It could be technical issues, of course, distance in the vagaries of space can play tricks, but the gnawing doubt lingers. Finally, the blue marble of Earth swells in our viewports. Relief washes over me. Yet, as we approach, that relief curdles into something, stranger. Magnify, I instruct. The view zooms, the continents, the familiar shorelines, growing in focus. Something is off, the distribution of landmasses, the sprawl of cities. General, Kyleen whispers beside me, her voice laced with disbelief, those aren't orbital habitats. I don't recognize any of them. A wave of unease ripples through the bridge. Our orbital colonies and space stations were a vital part of Terran infrastructure. Now, there are structures in their place, massive, gleaming things that seem to defy gravity itself. And on the surface, the cities. Old Earth, in her heyday, was a bustling ecumenopolis, but even her megacities paled in comparison to what we now see. Structures of crystal and metal pierce the clouds, impossibly vast, their geometry alien to my eyes. Tureller, I swallow, trying to keep my voice steady, scan those cities. I want life signs, human life signs. He sets to work, those extra hands moving with uncanny speed. Minutes stretch into an eternity before he swivels back. General, the Zalari scientist reports, his rumbling voice strained, I am detecting abundant life signs, but the genetic patterns are, unfamiliar. Distant cousins of humanity, perhaps, but altered. Evolved? I force myself to look directly at Earth, the cradle of our species, now impossibly changed. A thought stabs into my mind, as cold and pitiless as the vacuum outside. Lieutenant Stargazer, I say, dreading the answer, how long were we gone? She turns to her navigation console, her brow furrowed. After an agonizing pause, she replies, ship's clock shows 10 days, general. Standard subjective time for a warp transit of this distance. 10 days. But what lies before us is not the culmination of a decade, but centuries. Perhaps longer. General, Tyraller interjects, an urgency in his tone I've never heard before, I'm detecting energy buildup, coming from those orbital structures. Similar signature to what we saw in the asteroid field. Battle stations. I roar. It doesn't matter how we got here, or what twisted game the universe is playing. The only thing that matters now is protecting my crew and getting the hell away from, whatever this version of Earth has become. Evasive maneuvers. I command, even as my instincts scream that escape is unlikely. The energy buildup around Earth isn't the precursor to a mere sensor sweep, those orbital structures are weaponizing. Kyleen throws the Valiant into a desperate series of rolls and dives. Our colossal ship, designed for long hauls and scientific exploration, becomes a maddened starfighter under her touch. Warning lights flash across the bridge as she pushes the engines well past their safety limits. Blasts of pure energy lands from those alien structures, not lasers, not plasma, but something else entirely. They seem through space, carving glowing chasms in the void, homing in on the Valiant with terrifying precision. Shields buckling, port side. The tactical officer shouts. Even reinforced by Terran ingenuity, our defenses have their limit. We weathered the storm in the asteroid field, but this, this is a whole different order of magnitude. An impact rocks the ship. Then another. Consoles explode in showers of sparks. Crew members are thrown from their stations. 
I'm slammed against my command chair, pain flaring across my ribs as restraints bite into my flesh. The valiant bucks and groans, that steadfast old ship now a wounded giant. General. Turala reports, we've lost primary thrusters. Auxiliary power failing. Do what you can. I roar back, tasting blood from where I bit my cheek. Through the viewport, I watch as a final blast slices through the Valiant's flank. Atmosphere vents, precious air sucked into the unforgiving vacuum. Breaches open along the hull like weeping wounds. Our once proud ship is crippled, the fight knocked out of her. And yet, a surge of pride still burns in me. We are Terrans. We do not go quietly. Lieutenant Stargazer, I say, keeping my voice as steady as possible, open a ship-wide comm channel. All frequencies. It's time for one final act of defiance. My command echoes across the dying Valiant. Crew members, some injured, some shell-shocked, straighten to attention. They know what's coming. This is General Astreus Lionheart to the unknown vessels, I broadcast, pouring every ounce of fury and heartbreak into my words, you have attacked a Terran vessel on a peaceful exploratory mission. We. My voice catches. My gaze flicks to the image of Earth distorted by those gleaming spires, so familiar and yet so wrong. We may not be the Terrans you know, but we are the inheritors of a legacy of courage and the indomitable will to survive. We will not be your easy prey. Silence. Then a chilling voice, devoid of warmth or humanity, crackles across the comms, Terran vessel, you are trespassing in restricted territory. Cease resistance and prepare to be boarded. You will answer for your crimes. My knuckles whiten on the armrests of my command chair. Crimes? We are the criminals? But the fight is gone. Any further struggle would simply be a senseless sacrifice of lives. Acknowledged, I reply, bitterness coating the word, lowering shields. We will await your boarding party. I cut the comms and turn to my bridge crew, my family. Turaler, get those injured to Med Bay, do the best you can. Lieutenant Stargazer, vent the remaining atmosphere, let's not leave them a breathable ship. Everyone else, prepare for. I force myself to say it, prepare for capture. The boarding is clinical. Not the rough and tumble raid of pirates, but the precise, cold operation of a force that sees us as, specimens more than enemies. The new Terrans, if that's indeed what they are, move in armored environment suits, less humanoid and more machine-like. They subdue any resistance with efficient brutality, stun blast leaving my crew writhing. I stand tall, facing their leader. His face is hidden behind a mirrored visor, the suit itself an intimidating piece of gleaming black exoskeleton. Identify yourself, he demands. His voice is flat, synthesized, almost as if speech itself is a tool he disdains to use. General Astreus Lionheart, Terran Astral Fleet, I respond, keeping my chin high even as a trickle of blood runs from my split lip. General, the mirrored figure mocks, of an empire long extinct. Your vessel is an artifact. A curiosity. And you are its specimens. Before I can retort, I feel the sting of a hypospray against my neck. My world blurs and spins, legs refusing to hold my weight. As darkness claims me, the last sight I see is Kyleen and Turaler, also slumped to the deck. My brave, brilliant crew, reduced to trophies in an instant. My consciousness returns and jolts. Agonizing headache. Disorientation. When my vision clears, it's to the sight of a stark, sterile cell. High tech, every surface smooth and seamless, but a prison nonetheless. I'm alone, stripped of my uniform, clad only in a thin jumpsuit meant to humiliate as much as confine. Anger surges, quickly replaced by a cold dread. This isn't the brig of a pirate ship, or even the holding cell of some rival star nation. This is a facility built to contain something dangerous, something alien. And they've put us here. A wave of despair washes over me, the first since we encountered that damnable anomaly. Have we, the explorers, the vanguards, unwittingly brought doom back to the very people we swore to protect? Just how far from home have we truly strayed? The stark cell walls did little to muffle the harsh clanging of metal on metal as the doorway hissed open. Two figures entered, clad in the same black exoskeletons I'd seen on the boarding party. One, taller and broader, emanated an air of authority. The other, smaller and sleeker, carried a data pad clutched in metallic claws. General Lionheart, the larger figure addressed me, his synthesized voice lacking inflection. He gestured to a table and chair fabricated from the same cold, impersonal metal. Sit. I ignored him, remaining sprawled on the thin cot. 
my ribs ached from the earlier attack, and defiance was the only spark of humanity left in me. We are interrogator Xiphos, the larger one continued, and this is analyst Theta. Theta, the smaller figure, tilted its head, its visor seeming to peer into me. You've attacked a Terran vessel on a legitimate scientific mission, I stated, my voice hoarse but resolute. Explain your actions. Xiphos let out a sound that might have been a scoff. Scientific mission? You are trespassing on sovereign territory with an artifact of a long-forgotten past. He slammed a holographic image onto the table. It depicted the Valiant, marred by battle scars. This, artifact, I countered, is the ISS Valiant, a Terran starship. We were exploring an anomaly when, well, frankly, we have no idea how we ended up here. Analyst Theta tilted its head further, a gesture that felt unsettlingly predatory. Explain this anomaly, it rasped, its voice devoid of warmth. I explained, as best I could, the encounter with the warped space zone, the 10 second warp jump that felt like an eternity, and the shocking revelation of Earth's transformation. Their silence after my narration was thick and heavy. Zypho stroked his chin, an entirely unnecessary gesture in the confines of the exoskeleton. Intriguing, Theta finally spoke, its voice a mechanical whir. You claim to have traversed a, black hole? Something like that, I admitted, though our understanding of black holes doesn't account for, survival. They exchanged a look, something flickered behind their mirrored visors. You speak of a past where Terrans, explored? Xiphos asked, his synthesized voice surprisingly soft. Of course, I snorted. Exploration, discovery, that's the Terran way. We've been pushing out into the galaxy for generations. A long pause followed, filled only with the hum of the ventilation system. The air in this sterile prison felt stale, heavy with unspoken questions and a chilling suspicion that went beyond mere interrogation. General Lionheart, Xiphos finally broke the silence, your tale is, unusual. Whether it's a fabrication or not is irrelevant at this point. You are here, on Alpha Terra, and the Valiant presents a potential security threat. He slammed another holographic image onto the table, a detailed schematics of the Valiant, accompanied by glowing red annotations. Your technology is primitive, he stated bluntly. Yet, its presence here raises concerns. You will be, evaluated. Analyzed. And until we understand your true intentions, you will remain contained. His words sent a shiver down my spine. We weren't prisoners of war, not in the traditional sense. We were, specimens. Their words echoed in my head, artifacts, a long-forgotten past. They saw us as relics, remnants of some bygone era. A flicker of fear mingled with the defiance burning within me. We were Terrans, yes, but these, Alpha Terrans, they were something else entirely. We come in peace, I forced myself to say, meeting their visors with a glare of defiance. And if you're expecting some ancient Terran war machine, you're in for a disappointment. We're explorers, not conquerors. They didn't respond, simply turned and walked out, leaving me alone with the ghosts of my crew and the terrifying weight of a future I didn't understand. The days bled into a monotonous blur. Interrogations became a ritual, Theta and Xiphos prodding with their relentless questions as if they could extract the truth by mere attrition. They didn't torture me, at least not in the traditional sense. There were no physical beatings, no deprivation. Instead, they isolated me, pumped the cell with unsettling sonic frequencies, flash sleep disrupting light patterns. All designed to chip away at my sanity, to make me pliable. And yet, I clung to my story. The warp zone, the feeling of being stretched through some cosmic anomaly, our arrival in this strange, twisted version of home, a lie too monstrous to invent. Each time I saw my reflection, I scarcely recognized myself. The once vibrant general was haggard, hair shot through with gray despite the short time spent captive. My Terran enhancements, the genetic gifts that bolstered my strength and resilience, might as well have been crude prosthetics under the gaze of their cold analysis. One bleak morning, after a session of particularly unnerving questioning, I slumped back onto my cot and closed my eyes. Sleep was a rare blessing, but exhaustion claimed me nonetheless. When I awoke, it wasn't to the usual harsh lighting of my cell. No, it was something far stranger, a feeling of weightlessness. I was floating. My eyes snapped open. I was no longer in my cell, but in a medical bay, strapped against my will to an examination table. Glaring light shone down upon me. Above, a trio of Alpha Terrans, their sleek exoskeletons removed, stared with detached curiosity. They were horrific. 
enhanced far beyond anything Terran bioengineering had ever achieved, yet lacking a certain spark of humanity that even Turalar, with his Alari genes, had retained. Their skin had an iridescent sheen, their eyes abnormally large, their limbs stretched and elongated in a way that made them seem more insect than hominid. Subject Astrius, one of them hissed, a female, her voice high and sharp, you have been selected for the next phase of evaluation. Selected? For what? I rasped, the effects of the interrogation still clinging to me. We have thoroughly analyzed your technology, your physiology, and your, fantastical tale, she continued. The results are most intriguing. Inconclusive, but intriguing. Your claim to be Terrans from a different, timeline, is improbable, another stated, this one with a deeper voice and unsettlingly pale eyes, yet, your archaic genome is unmistakably of Terran origin. A paradox. The first one, the female, reached out a clawed hand to tilt my chin upwards, forcing me to look at her. We have come to suspect you are not what you appear. Your arrival, your technology, your story, it's all too convenient. Her clawed nails dug into my flesh. Tell me, subject, are you spies? Saboteurs sent by some surviving Terran colony, desperate enough to gamble on an absurd ruse? Their words struck a chord in me, a dissonant tone of terrible possibility. For every question I'd asked myself, every fear I'd struggled to suppress, they offered an echo, a twisted confirmation. Was this a nightmare scenario we'd failed to predict? Had the enemy we never knew we had grown this powerful, this cold, this, inhuman? We're explorers, I insisted, the words nearly sticking in my throat, we meant no harm, no threat. My voice faltered. Did I even believe myself anymore? The female Alpha Terran let out a disdainful hiss. Your words are becoming tiresome, subject. But the body, the mind, they do not lie. Prepare yourself. We will find your truth, even if it resides buried deep within your primitive brain. A sense of dread washed over me as they began reconfiguring the examination table. This was more than an interrogation. This was a dissection, an attempt to crack me open and expose the inner workings of my being, regardless of the consequences. I braced myself. The Terrans I knew, the ones back, home, they'd face any risk, endure any hardship, but always with an unyielding belief in the sanctity of life. These, creatures, the descendants of humanity that occupied this earth, had clearly inherited none of that compassion. They were monsters wearing a human mask, and now, I was their specimen to break. They didn't take me to a surgical theater. Instead, they brought me to a vast, cavernous chamber humming with the energy of strange devices. An obstacle course from a nightmare sprawled across its smooth metallic floor, walls to scale with sheer surfaces, pits lined with glowing spikes, force fields that pulse with menacing energy. The gauntlet, my captors explained with a disquieting lack of emotion. Each of our soldiers is required to complete it before they are deemed fit for service. We theorize. If your claims of Terran ancestry and extraordinary strength enhancements hold any truth, you should possess at least a fraction of our capabilities. They didn't say the rest, and they didn't need to. This was no mere test of fitness, but a rig trial. Their Alpha Terran physiques were designed for this course, their movements fluid, almost inhuman. My enhancements were powerful, yes, but crafted for the scale of a different era's humanity. You will attempt the gauntlet, one of them rasped. Failure, however, will be seen as further proof of your deception. The sheer audacity rendered me speechless. My crew, Kyleen with her dancer's grace and Turalor with his Zalari strength, none of us were meant for this spectacle of transhuman dominance. But to refuse would be tantamount to an admission of guilt in their warp logic. I saw the gleam of cold amusement in their iridescent eyes. They didn't simply want to break me, they wanted to crush the very notion of the Terrans I represented. I squared my shoulders and addressed my crew, gathered ashen-faced in the observation gallery above. Listen to me, I said, projecting my voice so it reached every one of them. We don't do this for them. We do this for ourselves, to prove that even in this twisted mockery of our home, the Terran spirit endures. The chamber rumbled as the course activated. The first obstacle loomed, a wall 30 feet high, lacking any foothold. I heard Kyleen gasp above. In the flickering light, I saw the others, scientists, technicians, engineers, gazing at me with a mixture of fear and desperate hope. I took a running leap. Powered by Terran enhancements, I soared, fingers scraping against the maddeningly smooth surface. I clung desperately for half a second, then fell, landing with a jarring thud that would have shattered the bones of an unenhanced human. Subject Astrius is. One of the Alpha Terrans began, the smug satisfaction evident in its voice. 
But I was already up and moving. The next obstacle, a pit of four spikes, I cleared with a desperate leap enhanced by the memory of a thousand tactical simulations. Then came a razor wire crawl, a laser grid, a series of force fields timed to crush anything too slow. Pain flared as my aging body was pushed to its absolute limit. Blood dripped from lacerations and half-healed bruises. Yet, somehow, I persevered. Each cleared stage was a victory, a defiance against a system designed to expose me as a fraud. From above, a sound echoed, at first barely audible, a cheer. Then another, and another. My crew, finding their voices. It wasn't the roar of a crowd on a victory parade, but the desperate cry of the downtrodden who'd found a flicker of light to cling to. Then, the final obstacle, a force field, not of brute strength, but precise timing and spatial awareness. There was no way around it, no brutal surge to carry me through. I would have to dance through it like Kyleen danced trajectories. My vision swam. The pain was a living thing gnawing at my focus. I took a steadying breath and launched myself forward. For a heart-stopping second, I was within the field, surrounded by crackling energy. I twisted, ducked, contorted my body in ways that should have shattered bone. And then, the ground rushed up to meet me. I lay broken, blinking up at the Alpha Terrans as they descended. Failure was a bitter pill. Had I doomed my crew to a fate worse than interrogation? Yet, a strange thing happened. The Alpha Terrans didn't sneer. Their multifaceted eyes stared at me with something that might have been. Grudging respect. You have exceeded expectations. One of them stated. Not praise, an observation. Another leaned closer, her irises seeming to shift color in the strange light. You are primitive. Slow. Weak by our standards. And yet, your determination, this is in alignment with baseline Terran behavioral models. I spat out blood and managed a mirthless laugh. So, I'm not quite the fraud you thought, but not enough to clear my name either. The third Alpha Terran tilted its head, a gesture that had become unnervingly familiar. Our conclusions remain in flux. You are a piece that does not fit. An anomaly, much like the one that brought you here. And anomalies. Its voice trailed off ominously, require further study. A shift occurred within the sterile confines of my imprisonment. The relentless interrogations lessened, replaced by a strange, analytical silence. The medical examinations, with their invasive probes and unsettling scans, ceased altogether. I was left to wrestle with ghosts in the quiet, my crew subject to the same unsettling isolation. Then, one day, they came for me. Not Xiphos and Theta with their relentless barbs, but a different breed of Alpha Terran. Scientists, judging by their less imposing frames and the way they peered at me with a predatory mixture of curiosity and aversion. They led me not to the gauntlet, nor to the featureless interrogation cells. Instead, they brought me to a chamber dominated by a vast holographic display. It shimmered to life, depicting a familiar spiral, the Milky Way galaxy. Yet, the comforting image of home was distorted, overlaid with swathes of luminous dots, constellations I'd never seen, nebulae of impossible hues. Subject Astrius, one of the scientists began, her voice thin and reedy compared to the grating rasp of Xiphos, we wish to understand the extent of your Terran knowledge. Don't you tire of these games? I retorted, exhaustion gnawing deeper than any wound inflicted during the gauntlet. We're from Earth. The Terran homeworld. Incorrect, another scientist interjected. You're valiant, yet, ill-conceived performance on the gauntlet confirmed a significant disparity between our species. The planet you hail from, while likely sharing distant Terran ancestry, is not the Alpha Terra we occupy. He gestured towards the holographic star chart, zooming in on a cluster of planets surrounding a dim star at the edge of the mapped galaxy. Identify. This is likely the sector of space from which you emerged. My breath hitched. The sector he indicated was vast, teeming with alien worlds, the density of stars overwhelming even to a seasoned explorer. My Earth, my familiar system, was nowhere to be seen. Yet, there was something. A pull towards a handful of worlds, a flicker of recognition I couldn't explain. I, we don't have anything this detailed, I admitted, forcing the words out through a throat gone dry. Our furthest colonies are a fraction of this distance. The scientists exchanged glances, those unsettling multifaceted eyes glittering. Curious, one murmured, highly curious indeed. They bombarded me with questions, astronomical knowledge, star lane routes, the extent of Terran expansion. Each answer widened the chasm between their reality and mine. 
My Earth, with its systems spanning civilization, paled in comparison to the scale of what they presented. The Terrans I knew, we were, provincial, clinging to our cradle despite the hunger for the stars. Finally, they dismissed me, their faces blank slates of cold analysis. I returned to my cell a different creature than the one who had stubbornly proclaimed his earthly origins. I was adrift, no longer an explorer with a clear heading, but a castaway in an ocean far vaster than I'd ever imagined. The day stretched into an eternity of uncertainty. I dreamt of the holographic galaxy, those nameless planets burning themselves onto my soul. Had we stumbled blindly into a future where humanity had not merely survived, but transformed into something alien, or was this an entirely separate offshoot of our kind, evolved in isolation? One haunting thought wouldn't leave me, the Alpha Terrans didn't see us as an invading force, merely a curiosity. An echo of their past, so distant, so primitive as to be irrelevant. We were relics to them, not rivals. Yet, this chilling indifference brought no comfort. My home, my people, my entire understanding of the cosmos had become insignificant. I was no longer General Astreus Lionheart, I was merely a specimen from a bygone era, a ghost haunting a future I no longer understood. Despair, a thick, suffocating fog, had begun to settle around me. But then, a flicker of hope pierced through the gloom. It came not from a thundering rescue mission, but from the most unexpected source, the Alpha Terran scientists. Dr. Lyra, a slender figure with an unsettlingly mobile face and shimmering blue eyes, approached my cell one day, an expression that could only be described as tentative curiosity etched upon it. General Lionheart, she greeted, her voice still laced with the scientist's characteristic reedy quality, we have been analyzing the data from your vessel and aspects of your physiology. I held her gaze, a spark of cautious interest rekindling within me. Data? You mean the Valiant? Indeed, she replied, particularly, the anomalies surrounding your unexpected arrival. The readings from the point of entry, the black hole sector you mentioned, are most intriguing. My heart hammered against my ribs. Were they finally ready to believe our story? Intriguing, but not enough, she continued, her expression hardening. The energy signatures you described defy known physical laws. Replicating them, creating a similar temporal warp, the probability of success is infinitesimal. My spirit plummeted. Infinitesimal. A fancy word for impossible. But not entirely out of the question, she added, a hint of something akin to excitement flickering in her iridescent eyes. Your technology, primitive as it may be, offers a unique perspective on these energy signatures. Perhaps, through collaboration. The unspoken question hung heavy in the air. Collaborate with their captors? The very idea was a bitter pill to swallow. But the alternative, a lifetime, perhaps generations in this alien future, separated from everything I held dear, was even more unbearable. What would this collaboration entail? I finally asked, my voice hoarse. A combined analysis of your ship's data and our own advancements in temporal manipulation, she explained. A long shot, to be sure. But. She shrugged, a gesture that seemed almost human in its uncertainty. Perhaps the only shot you have of returning home. My mind raced. The risks were enormous. Sharing classified Terran technology with a potentially hostile civilization. But the thought of seeing my own Earth again, of breathing its air, of reuniting with my loved ones, it eclipsed all other concerns. We'll help, I said, my voice steady despite the churning in my gut. Anything to go home. A flicker of satisfaction crossed Dr. Lyra's face, as fleeting as a shooting star. Excellent. We begin, immediately. The prospect of success felt distant, shrouded in the same uncertainty that veiled the vast, alien galaxy displayed on the holographic map. Yet, for the first time since my arrival in this strange, twisted future, a flicker of hope, however fragile, had rekindled within me. There was a chance, however slim, to unwrite the nightmare, to bridge the impossible distance back to the home I never expected to lose. The laboratories became my new battlefield. The harsh metallic walls that once confined me transformed into a shared workspace, a testament to the tenuous alliance born from desperation and a shared yearning. Dr. Lyra and her team of Alpha Terran scientists, once cold and remote figures, became begrudging co-conspirators. We pored over the Valiant's battered systems, sifting through logs and sensor readings. Their technology dwarfed ours, a stark reminder of the gulf between our eras, and yet those sleek terminals and glowing holographic arrays now served a common goal. 
Tureller, his Zellari bioengineering knowledge proving invaluable, worked hand-in-hand, hand, all four of them, at times, with their geneticists. They dissected the readings around the anomaly, a cosmic knot my primitive instrumentation had been woefully unprepared to untangle. Kylene, ever the navigator, integrated our crude star charts into their vast astronomical databases. Her graceful movements and intuitive touch on their interfaces drew quiet murmurs of surprise from the Alpha Terrans, grudging acknowledgement of her brilliance. It was I who spent the most time with Lyra. Our collaboration was both exhilarating and frustrating. Her understanding of temporal theory was eons ahead of mine, yet the fundamental questions I posed, born of a simpler understanding of the universe, sometimes led to startling breakthroughs. Your black hole, she mused one evening, exhaustion etching dark circles beneath her iridescent eyes, your explanation paints a picture of a highly unstable singularity, a rip in the fabric of space-time. But your ship survived. We shouldn't have, I stated, the guilt of that day a constant dull ache, that warp burst, it was a reckless gamble. Lyra tilted her head, studying me with disconcerting intensity. Perhaps. But perhaps, that gamble also yielded unique data on the very energy signatures that brought you here. It may be the key to replicating the phenomenon, controlling it. The weight of her words filled the lab with a tense silence. To control, a rip in space-time itself? The audacity of it boggled the mind, yet the allure of home whispered seductively in my ear. Weeks blurred into a whirlwind of calculations, experimentation, and dead ends. The Alpha Terrans had access to energies, to materials, and computational power that defied my comprehension. My crew, once relegated to prison cells, moved with strained freedom within the facility, their skills not merely tolerated, but desperately needed. We were rebuilding a gate to another reality, guided by scraps of data from a near-catastrophic event and the unshakable belief that the universe owed us a chance to mend the tear. Yet, with success came a gnawing dread. Their scientists, once focused solely on the anomaly, began to eye the Valiant with increasing interest. Our once belittled ship, with its osmium tungsten hull and Terran forged reactors, was now an object of intense fascination. Whispers circulated about the potential for weaponization, the advantages of dissecting and adapting the very tech that had brought us here. One morning, Lyra approached me, her usual calm replaced by an agitated tension. General, she began, avoiding my eyes, there's pressure from the council. They've grown impatient with the pace, the risks. I stiffened. The tenuous peace we'd forged, the delicate balance between captive and collaborator, was on the verge of shattering. We're close, Lyra, I insisted, closer than we've ever been. You have to make them understand. I have tried, she hissed, a flicker of frustration in her multifaceted eyes, but they perceive your crew, your ship, they are an opportunity. A tool to secure Alpha Terra's dominance, not just in this galaxy, but any within reach. My hands balled into fists. And what would you have us do, doctor? Betray the very principles that got us this far, knowing what awaits us if we fail? A heavy silence descended, broken only by the hum of machinery. We both knew the harsh truth. The Alpha Terrans were losing patience, and that patience was the only thing keeping us alive. Alarms blared, shattering the tense quiet of the laboratory. Red emergency lights strobed across the metallic walls, casting an unsettling glow on the faces of our team. Dr. Lyra's normally composed demeanor had fractured, replaced by a mask of raw panic. General, she gasped, her voice barely audible over the shrill wail of the alarms, they're shutting down the project. My heart hammered against my ribs. Weeks of painstaking work, fueled by the desperate hope of returning home, could be undone in a heartbeat. We rushed out of the lab, the sterile corridors teeming with Alpha Terran soldiers, their exoskeletons gleaming under the harsh emergency lights. At the heart of the chaos stood Xiphos, the imposing figure who had first interrogated us. But it wasn't his usual cold, emotionless demeanor that sent a shiver down my spine. This was Fury Incarnate, his synthesized voice crackling with barely contained rage. Enough! He boomed, silencing the scrambling scientists and soldiers with a wave of his metallic hand. This reckless pursuit of a fantasy puts Alpha Terra at risk. Lyra, ever the voice of reason, stepped forward. But interrogator, the data. The portal is nearly complete. Data gleaned from primitive technology, Xiphos sneered, his gaze flicking to me with undisguised contempt. And at what cost? Do you understand the potential consequences of breaching the fabric of space-time? Consequences? I echoed, my voice hoarse but resolute. What consequences are graver than remaining prisoners here, forever separated from our home? 
Xiphos ignored me, turning back to address the assembled Alpha Terrans. Imagine, if you will, he said, his voice low and ominous, a doorway open to any who possess the knowledge to exploit it. Predators from alternate realities, hungry for conquest, pouring through to claim this very planet as their own. His words sent a jolt through me. Was this the real reason for the sudden shutdown? Not a lack of faith in the project, but a fear of what it might unleash? Lyra stepped forward again, her voice filled with a desperate plea. But interrogator, these Terrans, they are living proof of the risks and rewards. They arrived via an anomaly, a testament to the potential for controlled temporal travel. Xiphos raised a hand, silencing her once more. Their arrival, he countered, could just as easily be a harbinger of invasion. We cannot gamble with the future of Alpha Terra on a hunch in the promises of primitives. He gestured to the soldiers. Take them back to their cells. The project is terminated. The world spun. Weeks of fervent hope, of forging an unlikely alliance, dashed in a single, brutal order. Despair threatened to consume me, but then, I saw something in Lyra's multifaceted eyes, a flicker of defiance, a spark of rebellion. Perhaps our shared goal of returning home had fostered an unexpected kinship. Perhaps she, like me, saw the potential for good in this technology, a way not just to escape, but to connect with a lost past. Whatever her reasons, I knew one thing, giving up was not an option. We had come too far, sacrificed too much. This wasn't just about returning home anymore. It was about defying those who sought to control the future through fear. As the soldiers began to hurt us away, a plan, desperate and risky, began to form in my mind. We might not be able to control the project, but maybe, just maybe, we could still control our own fate. Days bled into weeks, the sterile silence of our cells a suffocating weight. The project, once a beacon of hope, now lay dormant, a victim of fear and paranoia. Lyra's visit ceased, replaced by the stoic silence of the guards. We were prisoners once more, not just of this alien future, but of a system that had come to view us with suspicion and distrust. One day, the heavy cell door slid open, not with the usual metallic screech, but with a dull thud. Zypho stood before me, his imposing form casting a long shadow. The cold indifference in his eyes mirrored the chill that had settled within the facility. General Lionheart, he rasped, his voice devoid of its usual venomous edge. The High Council has reached a decision regarding you and your crew. I rose, bracing myself for the worst. Deportation to some remote corner of this vast galaxy? Or perhaps a more, permanent solution to their Terran problem? You have two options, Xiphos continued, his words measured. The first, you can remain here, in Alpha Terra. We will provide you with suitable accommodations, resources to integrate into our society. The thought of spending my remaining days in this cold, sterile world sent a shiver down my spine. Was this their idea of leniency? And the second option? I asked, my voice hoarse from disuse. A flicker of something that might have been pity crossed Siphos's multifaceted eyes. We can transport you back to the coordinates where you arrived. You can then pursue whatever method you see fit to return to your own time. A spark of hope ignited within me. It wasn't the perfect solution, but it was freedom. The freedom to carve out our own destiny, even if it meant hurtling ourselves back into the unforgiving maw of a black hole. We choose the second option, I declared, without a moment's hesitation. Xiphos inclined his head in a curt nod. Logical. Your vessel, the Valiant, is being prepped for relaunch. However, understand this, we offer you no further assistance. The portal project is, suspended indefinitely. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air. We were on our own, cast adrift in a cosmic ocean with only a battered ship and a sliver of hope to guide us. Leaving Alpha Terra meant severing the tenuous connection we'd forged with Lyra and her team, the only ones who'd shown us a semblance of empathy. But the alternative, becoming a curiosity, a relic in a society that viewed us with suspicion, was far worse. We had come too far, lost too much, to simply accept a gilded cage. As the Alpha Terran transport vessel carried us towards the coordinates where we'd first emerged, a sense of grim determination settled over my crew. The journey back would be fraught with danger, the black hole a gamble with near impossible odds. But for the first time since our arrival in this alien future, we were no longer pawns in someone else's game. We were Terrans, explorers by heart and by birth, and our fate, however uncertain, was once more in our own hands. The vast expanse of space stretched before us, an endless sea of stars and swirling nebulae. 
Yet, for all its majesty, it held a suffocating emptiness. Days bled into each other as we scoured the sectors IFOS had provided, a spectral map leading us to a phantom destination. The onboard sensors, once buzzing with activity, sputtered with monotonous inactivity. No gravitational anomalies, no energy spikes, nothing that hinted at the chaotic presence of a black hole. Kyleen, usually the picture of calm precision at the helm, nod on her lip, her brow furrowed in frustration. Captain, Tarala rumbled, his voice echoing in the tense silence of the bridge, the readings are consistent. There's nothing here. Disappointment, a bitter pill, lodged itself in my throat. Had Zypho sent us on a fool's errand? Or had the anomaly that spat us into this future somehow sealed itself shut, leaving us adrift in a cosmic wasteland? We can't keep searching for something that might not exist, I conceded, the words heavy on my tongue. We need to conserve resources. Set course for Alpha Terra. A murmur of dissent rippled through the crew. Returning to the very place that had imprisoned us felt like defeat. But our options were dwindling. We couldn't keep hurtling through space with dwindling fuel and a malfunctioning hope engine. Days later, the metallic maw of the Alpha Terran space station loomed before us. A tense silence hung in the air as we docked, a stark contrast to the hostile reception we'd received on our first arrival. We were met not by Xyphos, but by Dr. Lyra. Her multifaceted eyes held a mixture of weary resignation and a flicker of something that might have been. Concern! General Lionheart, she greeted, her voice stripped of its usual scientific lilt, welcome back. Doctor, I replied, my voice equally subdued. We haven't found it. Lyra sighed, a sound more human than Terran. I suspected as much. The anomaly that brought you here, it was a one-time event, a fluke in the fabric of space-time. So, there's no way back? Kyleen asked, her voice small, a stark contrast to her usual vibrant spirit. Lyra shook her head. Not through the means we envisioned. However, a spark of hope flickered in her eyes, a mirrored reflection of the desperate yearning in my own. The council has reconsidered. The project is not entirely abandoned. My heart hammered against my ribs. Were they reopening the portal project? But at what cost? They believe, Lyra continued, her voice barely a whisper, that by studying your ship's data in more detail, particularly the anomalies recorded during your encounter with the black hole, we might be able to devise a new approach. A way to manipulate the anomaly itself, create a controlled tier in space-time. It was a long shot, a gamble bordering on insanity. But after everything we'd endured, the prospect of returning home, however slim, was a life raft in the storm of despair. We're in, I declared, my voice firm with newfound resolve. Whatever it takes, doctor. Let's get back to work. Lyra offered a ghost of a smile, a silent pact forged between unlikely allies in the face of the impossible. The road ahead was fraught with danger, the path obscured by the shadows of the unknown. Yet, for the first time since our arrival in this alien future, a sliver of hope, fragile as it was, had rekindled within me. We were not merely prisoners or refugees. We were pioneers, blazing a trail through the uncharted territories of time and space, determined to find our way back home, no matter the cost. Months spent meticulously dissecting the Valiant's battered systems and my crew's near-death experiences became the foundation of something extraordinary, yet terrifying. The sleek Alpha Terran labs, once a symbol of our captivity, transformed into a crucible where desperation, genius, and audacious hope met. This is it, General, Dr. Lyra announced one day, her usually composed voice laced with a nervous energy that mirrored our own. In her hands, she held a device no larger than my fist, a cluster of shimmering crystals wired to a pulsating sphere. We believe it will function as a temporal agitator. Her explanation was a torrent of technical jargon my old school Terran brain struggled to parse. Quantum resonance frequencies, targeted energy pulses, the very fabric of space-time treated as a malleable canvas. Yet, the core concept pierced through the fog of complex equations. This device, if their calculations were correct, could amplify the chaotic energy at the heart of a black hole, forcing it to react. If this works, Kyleen murmured, eyes fixated on the pulsating sphere, we could coax that anomaly to open again. Create a temporary doorway through time. Turaler, ever pragmatic, voiced the doubts we all shared. The readings from the Valiant's warp burst, that energy signature was wildly unstable. Which is precisely why we need to refine it, Lyra countered. The agitator will provide focus, control. She held up the device, light glinting off its crystalline surface. 
Think of it as a scalpel, not a bomb. I look from the device to my crew, their faces etched with an echoing of my own turbulent emotions. Hope. Desperation. In the fear, gnawing deep, of stepping once more into the abyss. It's still a gamble, I admit it, my voice heavy, one with potentially catastrophic consequences. All temporal manipulation carries risk, Lyra acknowledged. But the risks of remaining here, of never returning home, for both our races, might ultimately be greater. Her words resonated with a bitter truth. If we failed, the best case scenario was living out our lives on Alpha Terra, aliens in a future we barely comprehended. But failure could also unleash something far worse upon the universe, a ripple effect born from tampering with forces no being was meant to control. Silence descended, punctuated by the rhythmic thrum of the agitator. Finally, I nodded. Then let's gamble. The Valiant roared back to life, no longer patched up and held together by sheer willpower, but augmented with sleek Alpha Terran components. With Lyra reluctantly taking the second-in-command seat, we ventured once more into the sector where we'd first vanished from our own time. Detecting a suitable black hole proved easier than anticipated. Space itself seemed, pockmarked in this region, riddled with gravitational scars. Target acquired, Kyleen announced, her voice tense. It's smaller than the last, but the readings are consistent with the anomaly. Prepare the agitator, I commanded, my mouth dry. My hands found their usual place on the command chair arms, yet it felt foreign, like I was playacting a role I no longer truly knew. Lyra activated the device. It hummed with contained power, the pulsations increasing in intensity. Our sensors went haywire as the targeted black hole responded, its gravitational grip stuttering and distorting. And then, a flicker. A tear in the fabric of the universe, raw and unstable. General. Lyra breathed, a mix of triumph and terror in her multifaceted eyes, it's working. A split-second decision, the only kind we had left. Kyleen, I barked, get us through that thing. Now. The Valiant surged forward, the roar of its engines swallowed by the cosmic scream of the anomaly. As we dove into the shimmering chaos, I closed my eyes, not in fear, but in surrender to a destiny I could no longer control. The warp ended, not with the breathtaking brilliance of stars, but a heart-stopping jolt of dissonance. Where the familiar swirl of the Milky Way should have greeted us, there was something else entirely. Kyleen, my voice cracked, where, where are we? She stared at the viewport, her eyes wide, mirroring my own shock. General, the star charts, they make no sense. None of the constellations match. It's like, like. Like we're in an entirely different part of the galaxy, Turaler finished, his deep rumble filled with a new note of concern. A chill ran down my spine. Had the Alpha Terran device gone haywire, casting us even further from home? Then a terrible thought surfaced, its icy fingers clutching at my heart. Time. Had the effects of the wormhole been more profound than we'd anticipated? Long-range scans, I ordered, voice hoarse. Search for any signature that resembles, Earth. We scoured the emptiness for hours, a desperate hope flickering against a backdrop of mounting dread. Finally, a ping echoed on the bridge. Sir. Kyleen gasped, her fingers flying over the console. I'm picking up a planet, it's the right mass, the right orbital position. It has to be Earth. A wave of relief washed over me, then evaporated as quickly as it came. Something wasn't right. There was a web of artificial structures encircling the planet, glittering megacities suspended in the void, orbital traffic that made our busiest spaceports seem like quaint backwater outposts. General. Turaler whispered, those energy readings, they're off the charts. Technologically, it's like, like what we saw on Alpha Terra. My blood ran cold. Hail them, I choked out, the order tasting bitter in my mouth. All frequencies. The communications panel crackled to life. Yet, instead of the familiar voices of Terran controllers, there was a smooth, synthesized voice, polished and devoid of humanity. Unidentified vessel, cease your approach and state your intentions. This is General Astrius Lionheart, Terran Astral Fleet, returning from an exploratory mission. Each word felt heavier than a mountain. Requesting clearance to land. Silence. Then the chilling response sent a shiver through the very core of the Valiant. Records indicate no General Lionheart, no Terran Astral Fleet, nor any significant technological advancement corresponding to that designation. You will power down your vessel and prepare for inspection. I stared at the image of Earth, transformed into something unrecognizable, and a terrible realization dawned. 
The anomaly, the Alpha Terrans, the desperate attempt to find our way home. It had worked. Perhaps too well. Centuries, not mere months, had passed while we were caught in the time-bending grip of the black hole. Our Earth, the one we fought to return to, had not remained frozen. It evolved, progressed, leaving us as relics adrift in our own time. A wave of despair washed over me, followed by a surge of defiance. We had survived encounters with black holes, navigated a cold and distant future, and bridged the gap between timelines. We were Terrans. We adapt. We endure. General, Kyleen asked softly, her voice filled with unspoken questions, what do we do now? I took a steadying breath. Our home had become a foreign land, the familiar contours replaced by the towering spires of some unimaginable future. But a flame refused to die, a flicker of stubborn hope that had carried us through the darkest hours. We hail them again, I said, my voice resolute. In this time, we tell them the whole truth. We tell them about the anomaly, about Alpha Terra, about everything. I met the shocked faces of my crew, and a hint of a smile flickered across my lips. And then we introduce ourselves, not as heroes returning from the past, but as pioneers from a forgotten age, ready to meet a bold new future. Negotiations with the evolved Earth, now christened Nova Terra, were a labyrinth and dance of cultural exchange and historical verification. Our accounts of Alpha Terra, the black hole anomaly, and our desperate struggle for survival were met with a mix of skepticism and awe. Yet, the data logs from the Valiant, the undeniable Terran technology we possessed, served as reluctant proof. Weeks turned into months as we acclimated to a world that felt both strangely familiar and utterly alien. Skyscrapers that scraped the heavens pulse with vibrant energy streams, transportation relied on sleek, gravity-defying vehicles, and communication was instantaneous across the vast expanse of the solar system. It was a testament to humanity's ingenuity, a breathtaking leap from the world we once knew. One day, as I navigated the bustling corridors of the Nova Terran archives, a figure emerged from a holographic doorway, his face etched with a mixture of shock and disbelief. It was William Parker, the fiery young politician I'd known back on Earth, his hair now a distinguished silver, but his eyes holding a spark that defied his apparent age. Astrius? He rasped, his voice laden with disbelief. Is that truly you? William? I blurted out, equally astonished. But, how? A grim smile played on his lips. Over a thousand years have passed, my friend. We Terrans, we conquered aging a few centuries back. Immortality, as they call it. My mind reeled. A thousand years. It was a gulf so vast, it felt like a chasm separating two entirely different species. The crew of the Valiant, preserved in a technological stasis bubble during the black hole's time dilation, had aged a mere handful of years. But those we knew, our loved ones, our families, they were all gone dot consumed by the passage of time. William placed a comforting hand on my shoulder. It must be a lot to take in. Come, let's talk. We found a quiet corner in a nearby observation lounge, a panoramic view of the bustling cityscape sprawling beneath us. As William filled me in on the millennia-long story of Nova Terra, a bittersweet tapestry emerged. Humanity, faced with the existential threat of ecological collapse, had rallied together, channeling their ingenuity towards not just survival, but a complete reshaping of their world. We haven't forgotten you, Astrius, William said, his voice thick with emotion. Your sacrifice, your courage, it became a cornerstone of Terran history. You paved the way for the advancements that allowed us to conquer aging, to push out into the galaxy. A bittersweet legacy, I muttered, the weight of a lost life pressing down on me. Perhaps, William conceded, but a legacy nonetheless. And now you have a chance to be a part of this new future, Astrius. Nova Terra could use a man like you, a man who's seen the universe beyond our borders. A spark flickered within me. The despair of a lost world warred with the thrill of unexplored horizons. We, the relics of a bygone era, could still find purpose, a way to contribute to this magnificent future humanity had built. Tell me more, William, I said, a newfound determination hardening my voice. Tell me about the stars. The look in William's eyes held a mix of sadness and a glimmer of hope. Perhaps, in a world transformed by time, a place could still be carved for the ghosts of a forgotten past. We may have lost our original Earth, but in the vibrant tapestry of Nova Terra, the spirit of humanity, forever reaching for the stars, still brightly shone. My immersion into Nova Terra was swift and disorienting. 
I trained in the use of their advanced technology, my tactical mindset a relic surprisingly valuable in an age of interstellar alliances and potential threats. Kyleen, ever the genius, adapted with frightening ease, her navigational skills quickly eclipsing the Nova Terran's reliance on complex algorithms. Even Taralar, his Zellari enhancements boosted by cutting-edge cybernetics, found his place in their scientific core, pushing the boundaries of biological augmentation. William, now a revered elder statesman on the council, became an unexpected mentor. He mourned with me for a world we'd lost while celebrating the indomitable spirit of humanity that continued to thrive centuries after our departure. Yet, even in this paradise, with lifespans indefinite and resource scarcity a distant echo, a shadow lurked. There were whispers on the cosmic winds, alien civilizations, some peaceful, others, less so. Nova Terra's expansion had ruffled feathers, its dazzling achievements creating not just awe, but envy and fear. One day, as I stood on the observation deck of their orbiting command center, alarms blared. The once serene vista of stars warped into streaks of light as unidentified ships tore through space, their design brutally efficient, devoid of aesthetic. General Lionheart, rasped a voice on the comm, strained and urgent, it's the Kavari Collective. They breached the outer defenses, they're targeting the capital. On my way, I roared back, adrenaline surging through veins that had forgotten the taste of true war. Old reflexes kicked in as I sprinted to the armory, donning sleek combat armor that felt both alien and strangely right. Within minutes I was in a fighter, not the bulky warbirds of my youth, but a neural-linked biomechanical marvel woven into my very being. The skies above Nova Terra erupted in a cacophony of energy beams and shrieking missiles. The Kavari, insectal and merciless, struck with terrifying precision. Lionheart to Nova Command, I barked into the comm amidst the chaos, form a perimeter around the main reactor. Their response was strained, tinged with panic that was chillingly novel for these ageless Terrans. We, were falling back, they're too strong. I gritted my teeth. Defeat was not in the Terran vocabulary, not in mine, not in theirs. Hold out. We're buying you time. My fighter danced between Kavari cruisers, weaving through a storm of fire, a relic warrior from a more primal era adapting to this cold, beautiful ballet of destruction. Kyleen's voice crackled over the comms, guiding me through the swarm, but even her brilliance couldn't hold back the relentless tide. Then, with a sickening lurch, my fighter shuddered. A glancing blow ripped through my shields. Warnings flashed, armor groaned, and through the haze of flashing lights, I saw them, Kavari boarding pods slamming into Nova Command, hordes of monstrous insectal creatures poised to spill out into the heart of this shining utopia. I roared in defiance, a primal sound from a primitive heart. Forging a path through the swarm, I crashed my damaged fighter into the lead pod, its detonation a blinding flash that momentarily staggered the enemy. But more were coming. Kyleen, Taralar, I rasped into the comm, the static growing louder, get the civilians out, rally whatever defenses remain, I'll buy you time. My words hung in the chilling silence. They knew, all of them, that I wasn't just buying them time. It was a desperate gamble, a final act echoing the old legends of Earth, of Spartans at Thermopylae, of doomed heroes facing insurmountable odds. The viewport blurred as I channeled the last reserves of my fighter's power. The sleek machine, my shield and weapon, became an extension of my will. Targeting the oncoming swarm, I activated the self-destruct sequence. This wasn't a retreat. It was a final, defiant battle cry from a man out of time, reminding Nova Terra, and the cruel, vast universe, that the Terran spirit, the willingness to sacrifice everything for one's home and for the future, could never truly be extinguished.